On June 24th, across the U.S. as well as across Canada, the Women's March 2024 is taking place on the second anniversary of the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn the 1973 ruling in Roe v. Wade, which removed the constitutional right to abortion, leaving it to individual states to decide when and if abortions can occur. On this occasion, we are providing you with an excerpt from the radio program discussion aired on June 19th on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO, broadcast over the air on 100.5 FM and online on coopradio.org. In it, Don Hemingway, one of the organizers of the 1970 abortion caravan that traveled from Vancouver to Ottawa to demand the complete decriminalization of abortion in Canada, speaks about the work to affirm the right to abortion, the health care that women require, and the right of all to health care. I'm really glad that we have the opportunity to talk about the Women's Strike uh, 2024, um, which is on the second anniversary of the deplorable uh, decision that was made about uh, women's right to abortion and health care in the U.S. when the Supreme Court um, overturned uh, Roe v. Wade. And uh, so across the U.S. and across Canada, there are women's strikes taking place on the Monday, the 24th of June, including um, in Vancouver, it's at noon at uh, City Hall. There's one in Prince George at 2 o'clock also at City Hall. But I thought that um, this was an opportunity for us to talk about that, that decision and also the, uh, the fights that have taken place to ensure health care for all and certainly um, to ensure that women have the right to uh, abortion and other reproductive rights. So the, the Supreme Court decision truly constitutes a, an egregious attack on women in the U.S and their reproductive rights, such as abortion. And it's part of that broad government attacks on women and children across the country at both uh, federal and state levels. These attacks include lack of access to affordable health care and child care, other backward legislation denying reproductive rights, denial of uh, paid maternity leave, um, uh, things like unsafe conditions for children in school and uh, the forced detention of undocumented women and children at the border, various things that are happening in the United States. The Supreme Court decision also brings to the surface a lot of significant challenges that we, um, as women, are facing in Canada in terms of affirming our uh, reproductive rights. If we look at it, abortion services are limited across the country with many women having to travel quite long distances without any reimbursement to access these services and other health services for that matter. Privatization and cutbacks by the government continue to negatively impact uh, the quality of health care for everybody and a growing number of people in Canada, including migrant workers and undocumented workers, lack any health coverage at all. And there's lots of um, fights going on among um, those workers and with lots of support from from workers and people across the country to address that question. Um, So the uh, response of women in the U.S. and in Canada and and around the world for that matter for that um, attack that took place two years ago um, has been to get into action um, in hundreds and thousands to reverse that decision. And we can see everywhere women are rising up to affirm their rights. And at the center of the struggle that we've been waging for so many years is the right for health care for everybody. So, uh, Don, can you tell us about your involvement in the organizing work in the late 1960s and early 70s regarding women's health, including abortion? We'd like to hear about that experience and its impact. Well, at that time, women 
uh, youth, workers, students. In fact, I think I would say society as a whole face really significant challenges, both here in Canada and abroad. As young women at that time, we were fighting for our rights, uh, for appropriate living and working conditions. Um, many of us, including myself, were both workers and students simultaneously. We were fighting to end racism, sexism, and wars of aggression that were taking place at that time, such as in Vietnam and Cambodia and other countries. <clears throat> we were also um, fighting uh, for the recognition of hereditary rights of Indigenous people, for the, the rights and the needs of older adults um, and those who are experiencing poverty, um, those with disabilities. And there were really um, rising concerns at that time about the environment. So these were quite turbulent, um, yet I would say positive and forward-looking times. We were, we were seeking ways to come together and organize ourselves to bring about meaningful change. We were determined to use our own voices, to, you could say, be our own change makers. And women were in the forefront of these struggles. Women's liberation groups were on the rise across the country, and women's health and reproductive rights were really significant concerns. We felt really strongly that the right to control our own bodies and to have free, accessible, and appropriate health care for women, and for everyone, um, was integral part of gaining control over our own lives driving that we were all seeking at that time. And you were involved in the organizing specifically regarding abortion? I was. Um, one significant concern in the late 1960s was the fact that abortion remained an offense that was in the Criminal Code of Canada, Section 251. And this meant that many women, especially those with limited resources, um, so couldn't travel to other jurisdictions outside of Canada, had no choice but to resort to backstreet abortions. And there were estimates at the time of thousands of women were dying in the course of these so-called procedures. So in 1969, there was an ominous bill, um, C-150, that was passed by the Pierre Trudeau government at that time, and was touted as being uh, what they called legalization. But it required women to seek approval from a therapeutic abortion committee composed of three doctors who decided for the woman whether the pregnancy endangered her mental, emotional, or physical health. And on that basis, um, a decision was made. So women did not have the right to uh, decide. In addition to a woman not being able to make her own decision, what is often not mentioned is the fact that under the terms of this bill, hospitals were neither required to have a therapeutic abortion committee nor to perform abortion. Not to mention the fact that huge areas and many communities in Canada didn't have hospitals and abortion clinics were still illegal. So this was totally unacceptable. So we decided to initiate uh, what was a national campaign to mobilize women and, and everyone to put it, an end to that situation, which was completely unjust. What did the campaign entail? Well, it's, it's become known as the abortion caravan. Um, we undertook research into the structure of medical profession and looked for alternate methods of medical organization other than free enterprise or fee-for-service. We raised questions about why unelected hospital boards and hospital abortion committees were making decisions about our lives, decisions that were ours to make. We condemned the practice of forced sterilization in Canada and in other countries, as well as what was happening then that was using women in Asia, Africa, and Latin America as guinea pigs to test birth control and other so-called related medical research. So 
our demand was that abortion be removed from the criminal code and made available to all women as a basic human right that would be part of our health care. And importantly, throughout this work, we had our own newspaper known as The Pedestal. That way we could speak directly to and with women across the province and across the country about this campaign that we were launching. And remember at that time, there was no uh, opportunity to use uh, email or uh, any kind of electronic communication. It was our newspaper and um, telephone. So the culmination of this work was the 1970 abortion caravan, which was a, basically a caravan of cars that left Vancouver and traveled from city to city across the country um, to our final destination, which was the House of Commons in Ottawa. And along the way, we just organized our, uh, all across the country. We shared our newspaper, we held meetings, debates, demonstrations, we engaged in lots of discussions that put uh, the right to abortion and related health care issues in the spotlight everywhere. Despite all this work, the Prime Minister and two Cabinet Ministers refused to meet with us. But uh, I should say that this was not a deterrent for us. We were going to carry on. So we organized a series of actions in Ottawa, culminating with a, a large demonstration at that, you know, the centennial flame that's outside the Parliament building. And we had media everywhere. And while the attention was focused on the demonstration, seven of us from the caravan made our way into the Parliament building with um, mysteriously obtained passes to get into the visitors' gallery. And we settled um, into every section of that gallery. If, if you've been to the Parliament building, you know that it, it, it is, uh, uh, there's four visitors' galleries that uh, sort of surround where the MPs are sitting. Um, so, once we were situated, we began calling out to the MPs about the need to get abortion out of the criminal code. And uh, the MPs were clearly shocked and not happy about our presence with only, if you can imagine this, there was only one woman MP in the entire House of Commons at that time, and that was Grace McGinnis. And, uh, so anyway, they had security called to remove us. But what they didn't know, and I'll never forget the look on the faces of the security guard that came to me, was in our very prim and proper dress that we wore as we um, went into these visitor's galleries on our um, passes that were obtained in some way, um, we had all also taken purses. And inside those persons were um, chains and locks. And so what they didn't know was that we had chained ourselves to our seats. So um, when the, uh, the security guards came forward, they, ha they didn't know we were, that we were chained to our seats. And so off they went for the wire cutter while we continued to uh, present our demands. So this uh, culmination um, of the, the abortion caravan led to the closure of Parliament for the first time in Canadian history and laid the groundwork for the removal of abortion from the criminal code and for advances with respect to the broader right of health care for all. And in the days following, um, newspaper headlines included angry women halt sitting in Parliament, protesters forced out to adjourn, after the women's invasion, protective shields urged for the MPs. So it really had a big impact. And if, if folks are interested in uh, looking at uh, the whole set of clippings from the caravan, they are in the archives at Simon Fraser University Library. Um, and also, um, there are, uh, they're, ac they're accessible in other locations as well, but that's one that, that you can find quite easily. Um, so that was uh, on around the time of Mother's Day, 1970, and really, um, I think, bringing together all those 
women from across the country, other supporters, being able to stop in all those towns and communities. It was really, it was really an important time for having discussion. And one of my memories is that we spent a whole bunch of the time while we were going across the country talking about, you know, we're here, we want to get uh, abortion out of the criminal code. But we also have other things that we've been organizing for that we want to change about the way our world is organized. So there was very, um, I think, important discussion about what are the next steps forward. So looking back on, what final thoughts would you like to share? Well, (laughs) there are so many things that I could talk about. Um, But let me highlight three things that I think remain critical today. First of all, when we organized around this question, we did the investigation ourselves. We looked into the issues that we were organizing around and and talking about. We developed our plans based on that knowledge and we established our own newspaper to be able to speak directly to the community. And that part to me was um, central to the work that we did. And I think back, as I mentioned earlier, of all the research that we did around what was happening with healthcare, um, the fact that, you know, there was deeper service, the, uh, the question of private clinics, and looking at the fact that people couldn't get healthcare, um, many people who were um, not well off enough to pay for certain aspects of it were left out in the cold. And we looked internationally about what was happening with um, the uh, question of uh, reproductive rights and how women in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and other countries were being used. So we, we did the investigation ourselves, and we started the newspaper, um, The Pedestal, so that we could share it. To me, that was a really critical component and led many of us to continue to do work in that way um, in the, the days, months, and years that followed. The other thing I think was important was that we all contributed in one way or another. And I didn't go into the detail, but we started uh, originally with a, um, a women's liberation group on the campus of SFU. Um, but then we, we realized that we should be working with women across the whole uh, lower mainland. And so um, we began to work with um, a lot of women who were not at the university and some of us who were at the university who were working to uh, get ourselves through. So we're also working at the same time as we were going to university. So we were able to connect and we started the Vancouver Women's Caucus and and the abortion caravan grew out of that and, and our newspaper, The Pedestal. So I think one of the things that we did was to really look at what skills um, did each of us have in all that organizing work and certainly in organizing up to the, uh, the caravan itself um, and where could each of us make the best contribution so for example I was tasked with going across the country to lay the groundwork for the caravan and other women made sure our newspaper and other materials were always well done and available Others um, organized meetings and discussions in the community, and others uh, contributed uh, in the realm of theater and art. We had a huge um, guerrilla theater component to this work, but everybody contributed in the ways that they were best able to. (coughs) And I think that's another big lesson for me about organizing as all of us seek to create a better world is looking at what skills people have and how each of us can best contribute. So for me, that was the second um, learning that was really important from that period of time. And then finally, as I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, and I think very important, probably, I was going to say most important, they're all important. Um, we had significant discussion among ourselves not just about abortion or about health-related issues, but how these things fit into achieving 
the emancipation for women and for everyone. And um, the, one of the things that made this very apparent was the uh, Volkswagen van that um, uh, was part of our caravan and that uh, I was part of decorating as we put slogans and we had, and on the van we had um, also a, a coffin representing all the lives that were lost. And there's two things written on the side of the van that I think reflect the discussion that was taking place, both on the caravan and um, in Ottawa and subsequently. And that was, one slogan was, abortion is our right, and the other one was smash capitalism. So we were tackling the question of the socioeconomic system um, and what kinds of changes were necessary for everyone to have the right to health care, but not just to health care, but to other things within the, within the uh, uh, broader society, both um, nationally and internationally. So, in, you know, in regards to reproductive and other human rights, above all, I would say the issue then, as now, is to get into action and fight for their affirmation. We need to be the voice um, of the uh, uh, society coming together to um, speak our mind and organize for the changes that we see are necessary. I think that 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 is probably the most um, uh, the biggest learning for me was it wasn't you know we talked we wrote briefs we wrote letters we did all the things you know we spoke at different meetings that tried to make our case, but <clears throat> there was no response. And so for us, it was, we have to have our own voices heard. And that's what we did, exactly. And so um, talking about these things today, for me, um, and, and uh, reminding people about the women's strike that's taking place on Monday, the 24th of June, uh, City Hall, um, at noon in Vancouver, City Hall at 2 in Prince George. And if people go to Women's Strike Canada 2024, you'll find um, where there is a, an action taking place in your community. They're taking place all across the country and in many communities in Canada. And we're supporting um, this, the um, work of the women in the uh, United States on this question, but our own work. Because just to wrap up this um, um, part of my, my contribution, <clears throat> it's important to note that even though abortion is no longer in the criminal code, the question of access to reproductive rights and abortion, and for that matter, health care in general, is a question that remains squarely on the agenda in British Columbia and across the country. And in fact, it's becoming increasingly challenging um, to get certain types of, of health care um, if you don't have the resources or if you don't live in a big center. And so these questions remain, I think, central today um, for our not only our discussion but our organizing and coming together and speaking for ourselves. Well, thank you, Don. The strength for the work of the women of the 50s that much headway was made not only at, at that time, but since then. Yeah, no, there's a lot came out of that work, and it wasn't just the abortion caravan, but I think the caravan um, brought together many parts of the work, and we learned a lot from that. And you'll see many women who were engaged in that work, the, the impact of it that goes on um, from the years since then, and so much still to be done now, to put it mildly. 